I'll never forget the first time I saw Katie Lucas. It was December 2010, and there was a special screening of The Clone Wars at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. The screening was a sneak peek of the first three episodes of the Savage Oppressed storyline, or as we now call it, the Night Sisters arc. R2-D2 was there, Dave Filoni did a trivia contest with kids in the audience, and right before the lights went out, he gave a special shout out to the writer of the episodes, Katie Lucas. After watching those three episodes, I fell in love with the Night Sisters, Asajj Ventress, and I became an instant fan of Katie Lucas. While she may be known in part for her famous dad, George Lucas, Katie deserves a spotlight all to herself. We're gonna look at what inspired her while writing the storylines for Asajj Ventress. How did her voice change Star Wars? And where in the world is Katie now? We're gonna dig and find some answers on this episode of Force Center Presents The Jedi Beat. I'm your host, Jennifer Landa. One of the greatest things about George Lucas is how much he loves being a dad. When asked in an interview what he wanted the first line of his obituary to be, he said, I was a great dad. Yeah. Well, I tried. <laughs> in 1981, when he was married to film editor Marsha Lucas, they adopted a child, Amanda. When George and Marsha divorced in 1983, they received joint custody of their daughter, which meant Amanda would split her time equally between her parents. Five years after his divorce, George decided that he wanted to be a father again. And in 1988, he adopted a daughter, Catherine Rose Lucas, and a son in 1993, Jet Lucas. Becoming a father is the reason George decided to step away from making Star Wars films. I mean, I gave up directing in order to become a dad. You know, for 15 years, directing. I just ran a company and was an innovator but it was uh, not doing what I really like to do, which is actually make movies. It was right after Return of the Jedi. I said, I made all these movies. I'm not going to escape Star Wars. And my central concern was my daughter. So I just said, I'm going to raise my daughter. And then uh, we ad I adopted another daughter and then adopted another son. And right. it wasn't until like 15 years later that I actually said, OK, I'm going to go back now and make direct movies again. And so from 1994 to 97, George began gearing up to work on his next Star Wars movies known as the prequels. Katie Lucas was eight years old when she made her big screen debut in The Phantom Menace as Amy, a young Tatooine girl who was friends with Anakin Skywalker. At that time, Katie wore braces, and so her appearance in the film marked the first time we learned that dental braces exist in the Star Wars universe. She'd later make appearances as a Twi'lek in Attack of the Clones and Chi Ekwe Papanoida in Revenge of the Sith. In addition to her cameos in the prequels, she was also a PA on those movie sets. Being a production assistant can mean anything from walking an actor to set to grabbing coffee for the higher-ups. It's not glamorous, but the job gave Katie a first-hand look at how movies are made from one of the greatest movie directors, you know, her dad. But George Lucas never pressured his kids to join the family business. In an article Katie wrote for Seventeen magazine in 2010, she shared that when she was growing up, her dad always encouraged his kids to follow their bliss and do whatever inspired them. After discovering her love for photography as a teen, she began going to her dad with ideas and questions about her work. And like any good father, who happens to be one of the most legendary filmmakers of all time, she said, quote, he respects my art while still giving me suggestions for improvement. End quote. The Lucases have always been a tight-knit family, partially because George raised Katie and Jet as a single dad. There's a fantastic New York Times profile on George from 1999. They describe George Lucas as a, quote, fiercely devoted, if sometimes indulgent, single parent, end quote. The Times profile also gave a glimpse on what their morning family routine was like. On that day, in February of 1999, George started his morning at 7.30 a.m., he walked into the kitchen and hugged Katie and Jet, who were already eating breakfast. Katie and Jet really wanted to watch a television movie about Sonny and Cher later that night. But in typical dad fashion, George told them they could only watch the movie if they finished their homework early enough. I love that Katie, who was 11 years old and Jet, who was six, were begging their dad to watch this TV movie about Sonny and Cher. This movie was about the marriage of Sonny and Cher and how Sonny was a controlling husband who betrayed his wife Cher. At the time this movie came out, Cher represented female empowerment. After she divorced Sonny, she became liberated and went on to a successful career on her own. So it's interesting that Katie, who was 11, would be drawn to this type of story. 
quite frankly, is the type of story I can see Katie Lucas writing, and is the type of female character that resonated with Katie over and over again. Going back to the Lucas morning routine, when George was able to, he dropped the kids off at school in the morning. And on that day, in 1999, as he was driving the kids to school, he told the reporter, quote, There's no one I admire more than single mothers, because they are the real heroes, end quote. 1999 was a formative year for Katie, and it was not because of Cher or Star Wars. 1999 was when The Phantom Menace was released. It was because of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Katie has said that when she was 11, she religiously carried a stake around in her backpack, just in case a vampire decided to brutally murder her at school. By age 12, she began having dreams about stalking vampires in dark alleys with actor David Boreanaz. Katie said that her father started to grow concerned with her fascination with vampire slayers and serial killers. But for Katie, her obsession with Buffy wasn't just about casting spells and killing vampires. It was that Buffy was a teenager who made mistakes. Katie liked that Buffy was, quote, vulnerable, impatient, self-righteous, impulsive, and has very questionable taste in men, end quote. Katie says that she saw herself in Buffy's constant battle to be understood in a world that is often unwilling to be accepting. The character of Buffy Summers made a huge impact on Katie's life and work, and it would serve as inspiration when it came time for her to write a resilient female character, Asajj Ventress. When Katie began college, she had dreams of becoming a poet. But out of curiosity, she decided to take some film classes. It was around this time that George Lucas began putting together a new Star Wars animated series, The Clone Wars. George knew Katie wanted to be a writer, and so he had an idea to see if she was interested in pursuing screenwriting. Here's Katie sharing that moment. I started working on this show when I was 17 and I just left for college. And uh, my dad just said, you know, you like to write. Here's the story. Why don't you try to do this? And that ended up being Jedi Crash. In the episode, Anakin Skywalker becomes severely injured. So while Ahsoka Tano and Ayla Sakura search for help, Ayla teaches Ahsoka about the Jedi philosophy of having no personal attachments. Ayla takes on a mentor role to Ahsoka in the episode. And there's just this great dynamic between these two female characters, which could be why George thought his daughter might be the perfect writer for the job. Since Jedi Crash was the first TV episode Katie had ever written, she got some writing assistance from the Clone Wars staff writer Henry Gilroy and writer Scott Murphy. But bear in mind, she was 17 when she wrote her first episode for the Clone Wars, and she was just getting started. After the positive response of the Jedi Crash episode, Katie decided to double down and pursue screenwriting, which led to joining the Clone Wars writing staff. The series had many writers over the years, but the core staff consisted of seven writers, including George Lucas. These writers would go on to write the majority of the episodes throughout the entire series. In season three, Katie would become a part of that core staff and the only female writer on the team. While she may have been a new television writer, she found that The Clone Wars was the perfect training ground to hone her skills. The best thing about Lucasfilm is that we really are a family, and I know I'm not just saying that because I am family with George. It's fun to like be in a room with a bunch of people that you don't know, and by the end, you guys are like best friends. It's fun to create and recreate, you know, this big myth. It's like a Greek myth that we're all just a part of. It's fantastic. Katie would eventually co-write Sphere of Influence and the Academy in the first part of season three. And then she took on her first independent assignment, the Night Sisters. Dave Filoni knew that he wanted to tell a bit of Asajj Ventress's story in flashbacks, and Katie was excited to dive into the rich backstory of that character. When it came time to design Teenage Ventress, artist Wayne Lowe and Katie collaborated on the character's younger look. It was very much a case of sort of reverse engineering what that person looked like. And that was all Wayne Lowe with ideas that Katie had because Katie Lucas was pretty specific about the looks. She was very keen to see Ventress have some sort of mohawk at some point. She should have a mohawk. These are all different versions of that mohawk where it could be, you know, straight up or maybe it's flopped over to the side or maybe it's shaved but it's um, slicked down a little bit. I like a lot of punk pop bands like Joan Jett. Brody Dahl of The Distillers he had this really big mohawk I had in my head, like just this fleet of Joan Jets and Brody Dolls running about. Tank Girl was a big inspiration for me growing up. If you don't know what Tank Girl is, it was a British comic book series in 1988 that was later turned into a movie starring Laurie Petty. 
The main character is a tank pilot who worked as a bounty hunter and then becomes an outlaw. Her boyfriend is a mutated kangaroo, and Tank Girl is prone to random acts of sex, violence, drunkenness, and vomiting. Prior to the Clone Wars series, the Knight Sisters already existed in the Star Wars universe thanks to the Legends book The Courtship of Princess Leia in 1994. But Katie and the rest of the Clone Wars team truly made the coven of the Knight Sisters their own. In thinking about the planet Dathmir and the culture of the Night Sisters, Katie drew inspiration from a novel published in 1915. I was actually really inspired by the book Her Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which I read in high school, and it's about this kind of utopia of women. The men who are the same species as Darth Maul are kind of like their slaves. I have come for the selection. Yes, yes, of course. Line up! Heads of each tribe line up for the sister. In reference to Ventress's season three arc, Katie said in a press release, quote, she's a cold-hearted harpy, but she has good reason to be. And now she's displaying a much more independent side of herself. Ventress is nobody's pawn anymore. She finally owns herself. I grew up on Buffy and Tank Girl, so writing for strong females is second nature to me, end quote. And there are definitely some elements of Tank Girl that you can see sprinkled into the character of Ventress, who is a Dathomirian punk rock warrior. When writing the Night Sisters storyline, Katie has said that she used music to inspire her, listening to a lot of early Hole and the Distillers. Quote, I really wanted to tap into that visceral female rage, and Courtney Love's snarl certainly tears that right out of you. End quote. If you watch the lightsaber duel between Asajj Ventress and Savage Opress and Count Dooku in the Witches of the Mist episode, you can absolutely feel Ventress's rage. And it's easy to see how this... <laughs> was inspired by this. Prior to the Night Sisters arc, Asajj Ventress was considered an interesting character. But once this storyline was introduced, she became a fan favorite. Her rage and desire for revenge became relatable. The coven of the Night Sisters and the power of Mother Talzin was fascinating to watch and unlike anything we had seen on screen from Star Wars. Katie brought her feminist roots, riot girl rage, and compassion to a character that started off as more of a one-dimensional villain. By the time Katie started working on season four of The Clone Wars, she felt a true kinship with the character she had helped shape. Here Katie is talking about going back into the writer's room for the return of Darth Maul. You know, when we went into the writer's room again to do these episodes, I was so in love with Ventress and the Night Sisters episodes. Yeah. I've really come to, so much of me has been put into her that kind of disillusioned youth <laughs> and you know i just wanted to carry on her story and i can't wait to see what happens next in yeah. her bounty hunter gigs katie wrote four episodes for season four which aired in february and march of 2012. eight months later george lucas sold lucasfilm to disney a little over a week after the season finale aired lucasfilm announced that the clone wars would be quote winding down effectively canceling the series as lucasfilm ended his contract with cartoon network Katie's final episodes for The Clone Wars would air in 2014 as part of the Lost Missions season, which was released on Netflix. To say that this decision was disappointing to both the fans and the creators is an understatement. But what was frustrating about The Clone Wars cancellation is that The Clone Wars team had several episodes already in development. Prior to the cancellation, Katie had been assigned the Dark Disciple episodes about the team-up of Asajj Ventress and Quinlan Vos. Katie loved her assignment. At the time, she happened to be going through a bad breakup, so writing for Ventress and Voss proved to be cathartic for her. Unfortunately, The Clone Wars was canceled before those episodes could air. However, in 2015, the Dark Disciple episodes found new life in a novel of the same name written by Christy Golden. Delray editor Shelley Shapiro said that they were particularly interested in those unproduced episodes because Asajj Ventress is extraordinarily interesting as a character. She's one of the few Star Wars characters who isn't just light or dark, but straddled both sides. Katie wrote a touching foreword for the Christy Golden novel, and the book debuted on the New York Times bestseller list at number 17 and turned it again in 2024 after it was revealed Asajj Ventress would appear in season three of The Bad Batch. When the Clone Wars series ended, Katie pivoted to directing. In 2013, Katie's short film, What's Left, What's Lost, had its world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival. The 22-minute film is comprised of two vignettes set in the late 1950s at California's iconic Madonna Inn. The film is visually stunning and stylistic, 
and the stories are intense and emotional. It's exactly what I would expect from Katie Rose. Just a note that professionally, she no longer goes by Katie Lucas anymore. While at the Tribeca Film Festival, she was asked whether her father had anything to do with her becoming a director. Actually, he had nothing to do with me becoming a director. I didn't want to be a director, I wanted to be a writer. But I mean, inspired me in film. I mean, I learned a lot from him as a filmmaker. He's great, he's been very supportive. Katie has also directed a few music videos. Her work as a director is provocative, bold, dramatic, and filled with stunning visuals. She is a true artist, so it makes sense that stepping away from Star Wars and the internet has given her the freedom to express her voice and perspective, independent from her father's work. In 2016, her video art was displayed at Art New York at Pier 94, a yearly special event that features contemporary, modern, and pop artwork. If you go looking for Katie or her work online, you won't find much. She used to be active on Twitter, but then unfortunately left the platform around 2011 after years of dealing with harassment from angry Star Wars fans. Because while Star Wars may have shaped our childhoods, its creator helped shape hers. She once said that the most important thing her father taught her as a writer and as a person is to always be true to her own vision and to never compromise. When the Clone Wars ended, she was once asked if she'd ever write on any other Star Wars story. Her reply, quote, Star Wars is my father's life work, not mine. I have my own stories to tell, end quote. Wherever she is and whatever Katie is up to, I hope she's telling stories she wants to tell. Who knows what Katie will tackle next, but I'm sure whatever path she chooses, she'll be following her bliss. I would love to see a Night Sisters show, executive produced by Katie Rose, animated, live action, I don't care. I know it's her father's life work, but Katie, Star Wars fans would love to have you back. I've been working hard like an Agna on these Jedi beats, so if you like this type of content, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe because next time, we're gonna look at the life of Carrie Fisher. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.